am a whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's now time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And now, The Whistler's strange story. Delayed Christmas present. Christmas was really over, for it was one o'clock in the morning at Pete's Cantina, a tough little night spot on the outskirts of Panama City. But the melody lingered on. You could hear the chimes of the big church a block away playing a death day for David. There was practically no business. Four hostesses, all Americans, were sitting drearily at the far end of the ballroom near the bar. One of them, Mary Winslow, billed as Candy Porter, just sat gazing drearily into space, thinking bitterly of a past from which for a while there had seemed no escape. But for five months now, she'd been relatively safe. No one had been around asking any questions. As Candy Porter, blues singer, Mary Winslow had found a kind of security, not a happy security, for she was far away from home. And as the chimes became silent, Mary wondered if it was worthwhile. A reverie was broken up as she looked up and saw Spanish Pete, a fat, greedy owner of the cantina, approaching her table. Candy, Candy, look, there's an American gentleman just came in. He wants to buy you some champagne. Champagne, oh, you hear please, that? please, Pete, not tonight. It's Christmas. I- I'd rather be alone if you don't mind. I do mind. Look. Pete. All right, all right. I'll let him spend his money on champagne. Ah, uh, now you're smart, baby. Here he comes. You turn and see the tall, heavy-set American approach. Suddenly you become tense. You recognize the type, don't you? After a year of running away, you've learned to spot his kind in a moment. You fight to remain calm as he reaches your table. Sit down, Mr. Fontaine. Sit down. Sure you don't mind, Miss Porter? Of course not. Thanks. In that case, I guess I will. I'll go get the champagne. I keep him on ice. Eleven years old, fool. Cigarette, Mr. Fontaine? No, thanks. He don't mind if I do. Of course not. Light. Thanks. Strange, spending Christmas so far away from home. Mm-hmm. How come? Business. Important business. Couldn't it wait? No. This business means a lot to the... people I work for. Oh, well, here's what you say, bubble water. <laughs> For Marseille, 13 years old. You said 11. That was from La Havre. This is even better. Now I put him back in the ice. You want some more? You just call Pete. I got another one on ice, just like you. Well, I guess it's kind of late to wish you a Merry Christmas, Miss Porter. So I guess I'd better just say, uh, season's greeting. Anyway, here's luck. Here's hoping you find whatever you came here after. I've already found what I came after. I'm glad. I hope you will be. Why shouldn't I be? Because I came after you, Mary Winslow. With the prologue of delayed Christmas presents, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, since this is Christmas weekend, I want to thank you for inviting us of the Whistler cast into your home on this special occasion. During the six consecutive years that the Whistler has been broadcast by Signal Oil Company, many of us have had the pleasure of celebrating Christmas with many of you a number of times. And believe me, we feel it a real honor that you consider us a part of your entertainment family. Tonight, on behalf of Signal Oil Company and the independent signal dealers who serve the states of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and Arizona, I want to say, we hope that your Christmas has been a merry one. May your new year be filled with peace, 
prosperity, and the good health with which to enjoy these blessings. And now back to the whistler. After a year, it doesn't seem fair, does it, Mary Winslow? After a year of hiding, using one name and then another. After five bitter months of singing at Pete's Cantina as Candy Porter, blues singer. This man, Fontaine, has come to take you back to the States. To face the consequences of one horrible night. You're sure he's a detective. He couldn't be anything else. You can't run again. There's no place you could go. You've only one card left. And as you face the man across the table and listen to his even, level voice, you decide to play it. If you play it carefully, it might be an ace. I think you know why I'm here. We're leaving in the morning for Los Angeles, Miss Winslow. Like the billing says, my name is Candy Porter. I know what the billing says. I know what it said in Brooklyn when you were billed as Doris Trent, in Denver when you were billed as Gladys James. But... When you first took a powder out of Los Angeles, you were Mary Winslow. You know, it's almost funny you should call me Mary Winslow. We used to work together, her and me, in the same floor show. We could have been billed as twin sisters. The customers used to mistake us for each other, too. Now, look, Miss Winslow, let's quit kidding. I'm not kidding. A lot of other people have made the same mistake you have. And like I said, I knew Mary Winslow intimately. I think I could help you solve your case if you, if you let me tell you about her. Sure, sure. Go ahead, if it'll make you feel any better. Thanks. You see, Mary Winslow was really just a good kid that got a bad break. In love with this swell guy and, and scared to death of a hoodlum. She, she told me all about it. it. It's quite a story. How about it is? Yes, it was quite a story, wasn't it, Mary? And it all began a year ago Christmas Eve at the Christmas party given by your employers in the pink room of the Swank Wilchester Hotel. You really enjoyed yourself that night, didn't you? And you were quite the hit of the evening. You sang three numbers and went over big. Your fellow workers didn't know your many talents. Everyone told you what a fine singer you were. And when you left, you were feeling good. So good, you decided to drop into the cocktail lounge, make a phone call, and have a nightcap before going home. <laughs> Scotch and soda. Mix it. Make mine the same, Bill. Got you. I, uh, I heard you sing tonight. You were terrific. Thanks. What's the matter? Did he stand you up? Who? The guy you were just talking to on the phone? No, I guess he didn't stand here. Didn't he? And he's on his way here right now. <laughs> yep, that's the answer. Lucky guy. Here you are, folks. No, let's take it out of here, Bill. Dollar now, here. look here, oh, Mr. Oh, take it easy. It's practically Christmas. What's the harm of my buying you one drink? Like I said, I like your voice, Mr. Winslow. Here's your change. Oh, thanks, Bill. You must be a detective. You know my name and everything. No, no, not everything. But it uh, wasn't any trick to find out your name. I just asked one of the boys if I could dance with. My name's Joe Clark. Oh, <laughs> I see you've never heard of me. Should I have? A lot of people have. Most of the boys and girls around the night spots know me. Well, then that accounts for my ignorance. You see, I seldom haunt the night spots. Well, you should. With a voice like yours, you could be packing them in in a good nightclub. Oh. Now I get it. You're a professional talent scout and you want to get me into the movies. No, no. I'm a gambler. Shocking. Well, I should have live and let live is my motto. And that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Huh? Live my life and let you live yours. Good night, Mr. Clark. My, my, my. Just think, tomorrow I can tell all the girls at the office I met a real live gambler. You could tell them all a lot more than that if you believed in your voice as much as I do. I... Really? Uh -huh. You've heard of Domingo's on Sunset, out near the ocean? It's an undercover gambling club, isn't it? It's more than a gambling club. It's a swell full of show. 
A lot of big people go out there, people that count. And they're all intimate friends of yours, I'm sure. Uh, not all, but I know quite a few. To push you right to the top with that voice. Oh, that's the oldest line I've ever heard. It's not a line. <laughs> yeah, but skip it. Go on home. Listen to the radio. Eat candy. You can have a terrific time. You go to Domingo's with me, you can't tell what might happen. You might have to meet a couple of show producers. So play it safe and go home. It may be dull, but you'll always get to work on time. Is that all you have to say? That's all. Nighty night. Wait a minute. Yeah? Could we, uh... Could we be back fairly early? Leave any time you say. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, now you're making sense. I'll call the cab. Never mind. I have a car. It's parked right around the corner. Clark used just the right approach, didn't he, Mary? You realize you're being a fool. But as the hours pass, you tell yourself your fears are groundless. Joe treats you with perfect courtesy. You watch the gambling for a while, then proceed to the silver room and enjoy the floor show. Afterwards, you have a little food and watch the dancers. we leave now? I said we'd leave any time you said. What is it? The music? Yeah, I guess that's it. Another guy? Another guy. My, uh, my fiancé. What happened to him? He's in the Philippines. Research. Uh, chemist? Doctor. Doctor Frank Wilson, M.D. That was his car we drove out here in. <laughs> he told me to keep it warm for him. Well, too bad. We could have had a lot of fun. Well, shall we go? Was it just the song, Mary? Or was it that uneasy feeling you have about Joe that made you want to leave so suddenly? It must have been the song. For as you're ready to leave the club grounds, Joe is still a considerate escort. Yeah, hop in. <laughs> Oh, unless you want me to drive. Uh, I'll drive, unless you mind too much. <laughs> no, I don't mind. Probably be safer, too. For several miles, Joe says little, seems preoccupied. And you feel relieved when he breaks his rather strange silence. Oh, uh, say, Mary, would you mind stopping for a minute to drive in? All of a sudden, I'd have an awful headache. Maybe I can get some aspirin. I doubt it, but we'll give it a try. Uh, you can keep the motor running while I'm gone. I'll only be gone a few seconds. Okay. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Joe! Get gone. Joe, you, you shot him. I said get gone fast. There's a gun in your ribs, baby. You just saw what happened to one guy that crossed me. Is, is he dead? I don't know. Oh, you. You. Oh, why was I such a fool? I'm right at the next corner. The car's been tailing us for the last time. I'm minute. glad. I hope it's a prowl car to take me the trouble of phoning the police. <laughs> didn't turn, baby. You shouldn't have said what you did about phone and the cops. You better pull over and park. We got a couple of things to talk over. I said pull over! Yeah, that's better. Please. Please, Joe, don't kill me. I, I know you can do it easy, but... I'll never talk about tonight. I... That's the way you feel now. An hour from now, you'll feel... Oh, no, I won't. I'm a word of honor. I'm making a deal with you, Joe. I'm trading you my silence for my life. I swear I won't talk about it ever. Okay, I'll take a chance. You drove the getaway car, so we're partners now anyway. We're going to have a lot of fun together, you and me. Now, 
How about something off of my face? Tell me where to go. I live about six... After you drop Joe and you reach your apartment, you're so weak you can hardly stand. Your senses are reeling, your brain is spinning. You practically fall into bed. You try to snatch a little sleep, but sleep is impossible. Finally, at six o'clock in the morning, the newspaper is shoved under your apartment door. The headlines sicken you. Drive-in operator shot and hold up dies. The subheadings are even worse. Unidentified man and woman seen fleeing from scene of crime in dark green 47 model Chevrolet. Pedestrian believes he can identify both car and woman. There it is, Mary. Hopeless, isn't it? Even if you called the police, your story would sound phony now. It's closing in on you, isn't it, Mary? Yet frightened as you are, you're certain of two things that you're not going to become further involved with Joe Clark. And you won't allow any unfavorable publicity to fall on your absent fiancé, Dr. Frank Wilson. You were foolish to risk a life of happiness with him, weren't you? For a few moments of excitement with a gambler, a murderer like Joe Clark. But you decide there's only one thing you can do, Mary. Leave town, disappear, and never see Clark again. You dress hurriedly, packing only a few belongings, and then spend Christmas Day and night at the home of a girlfriend. The next morning, you're on an eastbound plane. Three months later, you're singing in the Golden Lion, a prosperous little nightclub in Brooklyn, New York, where you become a featured performer under the name of Doris Trent. You're a great success under your new name. And then one night you have a visitor. You're sure it's Mr. Vern Shields, London musical comedy producer. Come in. I'm... Well, well, what do you know? Long time no see, Miss Trent. Doris Trent, it says on the program. All right, Joe, now that you've found me, what's on your mind? You double-crossed me, baby. You're crazy. That's why I left town, so I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. But you could still write, couldn't you? I don't get you. That anonymous note to the police, written just after you left, telling all about that driving job. You gave the exact time, my name, where I lived, what I had on, everything. But not a word about the girl with me. Funny, huh? You're the only one that knew all of that, baby. Oh, no, Joe, you're wrong. Believe me, I didn't write any notes. Couldn't have been anyone else. Two days after you left, they picked me up for questions. Anybody could have written a note like that. Well, one of your enemies might have wanted you out of circulation and tried to frame you. Yeah, maybe, but I doubt it. Joe, I didn't write it. I've kept my bargain with you a hundred percent. There's one way you can convince me. How? Marry me tonight. Marry you? Yeah. That way I'll be sure of you. Wives don't testify against their husbands. Besides, I'll know what you're doing all the time. Oh, Joe, I, I, I gotta go do my show. Let's talk this over. Tonight or else, you can run up to Connecticut. But go ahead, do your show. If you've got any ideas about calling in the cops, don't forget you drove the getaway car. And in case anything serious should happen to me, there's a written confession in my pocket telling exactly how you helped me pull the job. How we use your boyfriend's car. How you kept the motor running waiting for me. Your doctor would love reading about that, wouldn't he? No. No, he wouldn't. And don't get funny. Go ahead and on to your show. I'll wait for you here. You start down the hallway toward the powder room off stage. Suddenly you realize what a fool you've been. But you're not going to keep on being a fool, are you, Mary? Not with that wall telephone just five steps ahead of you. Operator. Oh, operator. Get me police headquarters. Better quick. hang up quick, babe, and I mean quick. You should have looked around before you called. I had a hunch you tried to double-cross me. Now I know for sure who wrote that note to the cops. Oh, I didn't, Joe. You got tried to call him, didn't you? All of a sudden, I've lost interest in getting married. 
We're just going for a little ride. Come on, babe. Start walking. No, Joe. I'm not moving a foot, not an inch. If I have to be shot, I'll take it right here. Let go of my arm. Hey, what's going on here? Something wrong, Doris? This guy bothering you? Yes, he is. He, he, he wants to date me. Tell him to leave, will you, Eddie? Maybe I'd better take him into the office and call the cops. No. No. Thanks, Eddie. There's no need for that. He's just another wolf. Tell him to leave. That's good enough. You heard what the lady said, bud. Start traveling. Okay, chum. Anything you say. I'll see the lady later. We parked right across the street. This Trent. You should have let me call the cops. I would have if he hadn't had you covered with his gun. Oh? Thanks, kid. Hetty, I gotta get out of town fast. After what you just did for me, that's a cinch. Grab some clothes while I phone my wife I'm bringing you home. We'll, uh, we'll go out the rear entrance. My car's on the lot next door. Tomorrow I'll call a friend of mine in Denver. He'll put you to work right away. Yeah. Uh, you better change your name, though. That'll be easy. I'm getting used to it. So, Mr. Fontaine, that's where I met Mary Winslow, in Denver at the Hi Hat Club. Bill is Gladys James. She, uh, she ran with me about two months, and then she she left just like that one night when when a waiter told her some guy wanted to interview her for a magazine. That's that's the last I ever saw of her. That's the end of the story. That's the end. And Mary Winslow told you all this. Oh, we we were very close friends. Oh, so you were. You expect me to believe that? It's true, every word of it. You know something? You ought to be writing stories for the movie. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Now that Christmas shopping is out of the way for another year, most of us are figuring ways to get our badly stretched budgets back into shape, which makes now a mighty appropriate time to talk about Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Mileage, of course, is only one of the reasons that folks who insist on getting the most from each gasoline dollar choose Signal. In addition, they like the superior performance that goes hand-in-hand with mileage. You see, the only way today's signal gasoline can give you such good mileage is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, you also enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, smoother power, the things that make driving more pleasure. So, among your resolutions for the new year, how about resolving to put signal gasoline to the test in your car? See for yourself why drivers who insist on quality as well as those with an eye for economy, are both switching to signal the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. Well, Mary, it looks as though you've lost, doesn't it? That your one card wasn't enough. The man across the table, the man you're sure is a detective, who has come to take you back to Los Angeles, to stand trial for a hold-up and murder you had nothing to do with doesn't believe you, does he? And the jury in Los Angeles won't believe you either. Yes, Mary, it looks as though you've lost. But you're going to play the game to the end anyway. And as the piano player across the floor plays the tune he's played a thousand times in the last two weeks, you quietly watch Fontaine and await his next word. How long did you say you've been here? I didn't say. I got here about five months ago. I get here? No. That's what I figured. Look, a Miss... Cigarette? Uh, yeah, thanks. All right. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Miss Porter. Uh, did you say Miss Porter? 
That's what you said your name was, didn't you? That's what the billing says, too, isn't it? Oh, thanks, Mr. Fontaine. Thanks for believing me. Uh, there's just one thing I'd like to ask you, Mr. Ask me anything. Uh, knowing Miss Winslow as well as you do, do you think she might come back to Los Angeles sometime and sort of clear things up? I think she might. Someday. You see, a, a girl like Mary Winslow gets to feel kind of soiled after working around in joints like this. She'd probably want to spend a little time maybe out in the desert in the sunshine. Sort of freshening up before anybody she cared about. Yeah. I guess she would. Well, this was a pretty long trip for nothing, you must say. Just one more bum steer. But I'm glad it came. I always figured that confession we found on Joe Clark was a phony. Clark? Is Joe Clark in jail? He's dead. The Brooklyn police got him one night about uh, five months ago. Anyhow, they got the tip. A woman called the police one night from the little nightclub, the Golden Lion Club. She hung up before they answered the phone, but the Brooklyn boys decided to investigate anyway. One of them spotted Clark parking the car across the street, and he got trigger happy. How was that? Joe Clark. Finished. Well, Miss Porter, if you ever run into Mary Winslow... I'll tell her all about the Christmas present I got from a swell cop named Fontaine. <laughs> I'm not a cop, Miss Porter. You're not? Then... Then who are you? I'm a private investigator. Working for a guy named... Wilson. Dr. Frank Wilson. Frank Wilson? That's right. He's in love with Mary Winslow. Doesn't care where she's been. Just wants her to come back and marry him. Well, uh, so long, Miss Porter, and Happy New Year. N Mr. Fontaine. Yes? Do you... Do you think you could arrange for me to go back to the States with you? I guess I could. I was figuring on taking one lady back. Are you going on food or things? Not for a while. I'd kind of like to spend a little time in the country somewhere. But I think maybe before next Christmas. Well, I think... I'll find Mary Winslow again. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. Now let me repeat an important announcement for Whistler fans in California only. Beginning next Sunday, January 2nd, due to California's going off daylight saving time, the Whistler will be heard in California only one hour earlier from 8.30 until 9. Remember the change in time in California only, the Whistler will be heard at a new time from 8.30 till 9. In other states, the Whistler will be heard at the same time as always. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Joan Banks and Jack Petruzzi. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon Hughes, with story by Edward Bloodworth and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.